This is Trek Wire Week in Review for week ending July 8th, 2022. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS Commercial Real Estate and CLO Markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Henry, Head of Siri and Advisory Services. This week, investors are on recession watch as the Fed minutes make it clear that the central bank will do what it takes to bring inflation down. Other economic data point to pockets of economic slowdown. Oil prices rose sharply after losses on downturn fears. Services activity slowed last month. Jobless claims ticked up and demand for labor slowed slightly. Manus, U.S. Treasury yields were higher, even as the two-year to 10-year part of the yield curve inverted again this week. Well, I think that market watchers, researchers, traders, investors are really having a tough time making head or tail out of this particular set of circumstances, right? They, they really are swinging very violently between are we going to have a crash landing or are we going to have hyperinflation? And on top of that, you have FX volatility, you have oil volatility, and you have stock market volatility. So I think all of that is painting a picture that is very opaque. I think that Market watchers are as confused as they've ever been about which direction this can take. It does make sense. We're dealing with unprecedented levels of liquidity that were pumped into the system over the last two years. We've never had a situation where it has been necessary to unwind this type of stimulus. We've seen inflation accelerate at a really rapid rate. We've never seen the job market quite as tight as it's been the last couple of years. So there's a lot of first times that investors are trying to get their arms around. The thing that I watch every day more than anything else lately is those bond yields that you referred to. They may not inform me which way we're going because I don't think that anybody knows, but it does inform you as to what the investment community is thinking at that very moment. What we saw over a 10-day span was interest rates drop about 70 basis points. We saw the 10-year go from 350 to about 280 or even less. And we saw the two-year go from 345 down to about 380 as well. So huge drops that corresponded to uh, a huge reduction in mortgage rates, almost 100 basis points during a a two-week stretch recently. But what that is informing you is at that very moment, everybody believes that we are headed for a crash landing. Over the last two or three days, we've reversed course, the 10-year and the two-year are up about 20 basis points. And now it seems like the sentiment is starting to reverse course and inflation now is the predominant worry. I don't think anybody has a firm grasp of how this plays out, but that does give you a sense of at, at any given time or any given day, what traders and investors are feeling. Yeah, it's interesting, man. It's to kind of tie into your making head or tails. Uh, there were a couple of headlines that uh, made a few folks smile this week. On July 1st, uh, JP Morgan analyst talked about oil prices and they warned that oil could go to uh, $380 if US and European penalties, you know, prompt Russia to cut their crude outputs. And then on July 5th, city analyst came out and said that crude oil prices could collapse to $65 a barrel by the end of this year and 45 by the end of 2023, if, uh, you know, a recession hits. So, you know, I think uncertainty, we've talked about that quite a bit. Making head or tails is a good way to sum that up. Depending on your perspective, um, it's, it's difficult to know what the next move is. Just some other macro uh, headlines from this week. Mortgage rates dropped for the second week in a row. This was the largest decline since December of 08. Uh, in this example, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage uh, averaged 5.3% in the week ending uh, today, uh, down from 57 the week before. That was according to Freddie Mac. Still significantly higher just for context. This time last year was at 2.9%. The uh, rental market, we talked a little bit about that last week, about some markets really heating up and having you know competitive bidding wars. Overall, though, the markets have, have started to slow down in some of the hottest cities. So uh, Zumper actually put out a study that said, uh, median rents for uh, two bedrooms were two, down 2.9%. And just overall, after rents had surged about 11% over the last 12 months, 
you know, one bedroom rents rose just 0.5% in June. So a lot of, uh, you know, things to keep an eye on there. Interesting, uh, not surprising, New York City was the most expensive place for renters. One bedroom units are $600 a month more than the second most expensive city, which is San Francisco. So, you know, just some interesting stuff on the rental market. And I think one last thing here, copper prices uh, have fallen to their lowest level in nearly two years. Uh, investor concerns about an economic slowdown. So I think the central theme here is everyone's worried about the recession. We, we heard what the, uh, the Fed, you know, what came out in their notes this week, they're probably going to raise rates again. So again, the uncertainty is, is I think being felt across the spectrum. I think that there's two kind of polar opposite things that I'm watching for the next two weeks. One is kind of positive and it kind of carries over from the theme of, of last week and one is kind of a negative. On the positive side, what is encouraging is the pace of commerce in this country continues to be firm. And we'll talk more about that later in terms of leasing, property sales. Um, you know, the machine is still working. Lending is still taking place. People are refinancing, people are buying properties and, and, and that's a positive sign. The other positive sign I would throw out there is in times of whiplash of markets, whether it's equities, oil, copper, foreign exchange, this is that time when you expect somebody to be caught up in that world, which is they're on the wrong side of the bet, they're highly levered, and they, they are facing a liquidity issue. We've seen some of that in crypto, but crypto I kind of look at as its own kind of contained cocoon, if you will. It doesn't really, to this point, because it's so na nascent, uh, expand to the broader financial markets, at least not a ton. But in, in times of this volatility, you worry about a hedge fund uh, or insurer or somebody being on the wrong side of a bet and that having some kind of systemic risk, right? We haven't seen that yet. And as long as we don't see that, and we have confidence that there isn't some kind of contagion ready to have, we should be able to muddle through. So speaking of muddling through, we have our delinquency report and last month's data shows a, an uptick. So the question is, is that uh, the beginning of a new trend or is it just a blip? Well, we are careful to say that uh, one month does not a trend to make. So I'm not willing to say that, you know, this is the beginning of a surge. Uh, I'm not sure that this is the case, but I do think after seeing the delinquency rate drop from 10% uh, almost exactly two years ago to a little over 3% now, I do believe that any further improvements will be much harder to see than what we've seen over the last 24 months. Uh, I think Haley was working on a Twitter poll or some kind of poll that we were going to put out there that was going to say, uh, ask our audience, is this a, a blip, an inflection point? Uh, is the end near or the heavy stuff will blow over soon? Uh, and we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that when we put that, that poll out there. But what we saw was a modest uptick, uh, only a couple of basis points. We went from 3.14% last month to 3.20%, an increase of six basis points. That was pretty evenly distributed across all property types, modest single digit to I think as high as 12 basis point increase in delinquencies month over month, pretty evenly spread out among all property types. Nothing jumped out at us. There was no outliers in terms of this looks problematic or that looks problematic. Uh, in research we'll put out next week, we actually saw an uptick in the percentage of loans that were able to refinance this month versus May. So I think time will tell. I don't think we're going from 320 this month to 250 anytime soon. It, it wouldn't surprise me if we stayed range bound within some kind of window, which is 30 basis points higher, 30 basis points lower until we get more clarity about where this economy is going. Yeah, if you actually bucket this out, Manis, the percentage of loans in the 30 days delinquent bucket so we track things 30, 60, 90, et cetera, uh, was 0.18%. So it was up five basis points for the month. So as Martha asked, is this maybe a leading indicator of some 
you know, influx of new delinquencies. I think that would say, you know, that's not outside of, of the norm in terms of a month over month type of uh, increase. Um, but I do agree with you that, you know, we saw a huge uptick with COVID. We saw those things rapidly come down. The properties that are still delinquent probably have something wrong with them at an underlying level. So they're just op operating at a level that's not going to get them out of the delinquency bucket anytime soon. And for a lot of these other properties that are kind of fringe, I think we're going to see over the next 90, you know, 180 days, you know, how they're going to be able to handle, handle the market if it does slow down. So we have some stuff we'll talk about later today, you know, work from home or offices feeling distressed or whatever. If people start downsizing at scale, you know, I could see this number increasing, but I don't think there's anything in the data. I would agree with you at this point that that signifies you know, we're going to see this ramp back up. I think we're probably going to hover where we're at until we get some more certainty in the market, if it's really going to slow down or if it's going to just kind of muddle through, like we talked about in the open. I, I think the tell will be that category of balloons that can't pay off. And as I said, you know, as I cautioned in the beginning, one month does not make a trend. You know, if we're going to start seeing a blip in loans not being able to pay off, you would expect it to start happening pretty soon. And as I mentioned, we did see a, an uptick this month in the, in the amount of loans that were able to pay off. Uh, in fact, this month we had a billion dollars worth of loans coming due. They would be 10 year loans from 2012 or five year loans from 2017. Uh, and that's just conduit, by the way, I'm not talking about SASB or floating rate, um, but about 60% of those that reached their maturity date um, paid off. And what we've seen is historically in the following three months, another 20% do pay off, which is a pretty healthy number in a market with a lot of uncertainty. But if we start seeing that number go down to 35%, 30, 25%, then you're starting to say conditions are getting harder and tighter to get refinancing for. So that's, that's the big number we'll watch. So we have a lot of stories this week. I'm certain we're probably going to have to pare them down. So let's get started with office. Um, we saw an office story this week in the Wall Street Journal. Now, we, we normally tend to start with the positive green shoots, but there was a, a, a bit of a crabgrass story in uh, office vacancies. Mark Murrow wrote, wrote a story that office vacancies have increased across the U.S. over the past year, and about 17.5% of office spaces either weren't leased or were leased, but available for sublease at the end of the second quarter uh, according to Cushman and Wakefield. Yeah, that was one of two this week from the Wall Street Journal. There was a second one today that talked about how hard it was for employers to get people coming back to the office, especially in the big cities. They said that New York and San Francisco were among those that were struggling the most. Uh, as usual, they were using Castle Systems data, which we look at all the time. It has been nettlesome. I think that for the last several weeks, I've, tr I've tried to put out a balanced number of stories. And I do think the story is quite even-handed. I think for every negative story that you see out there of somebody downsizing or permanently working from a home, there is another story of somebody um, taking more space or renewing a lease. But that shouldn't be taken to mean that there isn't crabgrass out there. There's, there's certainly plenty of it. Yeah, we've talked about this, and I think we'll we'll go through some of the stories. What what's what I think we're seeing play out in real time is just there's winners and losers. So to your point, Manus, you know some of these cities are having an influx of companies move there, and so their office market's stronger than maybe it has been in the last five or ten years. And others are seeing downsizing or you know people just vacating their lease altogether. I was thinking about it as we we're getting ready for the uh, the podcast today. We've talked a lot about the hotel industry at the beginning of the pandemic and how quickly it was able to rebound and turn around because they're in a night to night business. So they felt the, the brunt of the impact obviously immediately, but they were able to rebound. The office sector has benefited from these long-term leases, staggered tenant expiration dates and all of these things. So it's been able to withstand. But I wonder in some of these markets, if we're hitting a critical mass where when a building goes to say 50% occupancy, it's a lot harder to get that office building leased up to stabilize market occupancy, maybe 90% than it is to get a hotel or somebody else up to speed or a, a small strip retail center up to 90% occupancy. So, you know, while this is maintained better, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the stories here in a minute uh, over the pandemic, 
I wonder if it's also going to be more prolonged when some of these buildings actually do hit rock bottom, just because the nature of that business is going to be harder to fill those those buildings up uh, in a short term, and the rental rates are going to be depressed. And on a long term lease, like there's just all these things that just add on to compound some of that negative perception that we've been talking about. Yeah, I, I think you hit it spot on. I think it'll be winners and losers. It'll be episodic, but there is this negative momentum that once you you hit a tipping point, you can't turn it around. I don't know why this just popped into my head. Maybe you guys were just watching, you know, the feel good uh, Hoosier story before, you know, uh, with Norman Dale and, and Hickory Creek or whatever their school was. But I was thinking that uh, they should someday make a a movie about uh, Times Square building that Durst had that was 0% occupied and that Durst organization fought their way out of uh, having lost Condé Nast and Skadden Arps and refilled it in full. I mean, I think you get some of that heavy violin music, maybe you get Gene Hackman out of retirement and, and, and you got a winner there, Lonnie. I think you, know, you, you told us you wanted to be a poet, maybe, maybe a screenwriter. Yeah, maybe I have to be a... Uh, <laughs> that movie would be such a niche movie. You think it got yeah. it in you, Lonnie? Can you do something heartwarming? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think we've now you've told the audience that uh, you, you pre-gamed to the podcast with Hoosiers. Uh, and, you know, I was listening to the Rocky soundtrack before we came on. So uh, that's how I get myself pumped up for these days. So now that we're pumped up, how are you feeling? Crabby or are you feeling green? Well, I feel like the last few weeks I've been very green to start. Yeah. And... I, right. I never want to get the reputation of a, a as a cheerleader, so let me start with some of the uh, the crabgrass and and then we'll pivot to the green. There's plenty of green, don't get me wrong, but we'll start with the with the crabgrass. This one might be even more than crabgrass. We may call this bamboo. You ever try to get bamboo out of your backyard, Lonnie? It's impossible, invasive. impossible. Yeah. You can't it's get it. It's impossible. Crabgrass, you you have a fighting chance against, but bamboo, not a chance. This one is from Alex Halverson of the Puget Sound. Business Journal, uh, he reports that Microsoft will be giving back 600,000 square feet at the Advanta Office Commons in Bellevue. And we can look at this one of two ways we did in our trip wire, I think going out tomorrow morning, that this is either a really negative story or just a modestly negative story, right? Microsoft has 2.7 million square feet in the Bellevue area all of which ends in, in or before 2025. This represents, you know, about 20%, 22% of that space. If this is a one-off and this is what they're giving back, then every other office building with Microsoft in it, in that area is much more secure. If this is part of something bigger where they want to give back, you know, 40, 50, 60% of their space, that would be a huge negative for not just that one property that has Microsoft, but the entire region. So that's one that we're watching very closely. A couple of other things that we saw this week in Arizona, this is from AZ Big Media. The Phoenix office market continues to see record high sublease availability. Uh, this comes from a report from Kidder Matthews in LA. This is from Isabella Farr. And I think we'll have another story from her a little bit later. Uh, she's from The Real Deal LA. She said leasing deals here and there starting to fall out of contract, which is the kind of thing that you start to see when markets uh, unravel. And then lastly, this is for longtime loyal listener Anne L. She's always urging us to do more in Europe. But we did notice that BizNow's Tim Clark said that working from home has led UBS to offer 15% of its London office up for sublet. So these are all of a piece out there, right? Softer markets, subleasing taking place, and uh, firms reducing office space. I can throw a little uh, crabgrass on there for you too, Manis. LA-based Corn Ferry plans to by the end of decide by the end of the year whether to shrink their 900,000 square foot of offices across 85 uh, different locations by 10 or 15 percent uh, based on data that they're accumulating on worker attendance. So CFO uh, Robert Rozak said the company already generated over 10 million in annual savings from giving back roughly 230,000 square foot since the pandemic began. Um, and so, you know, that's something to keep an eye on. That's a pretty large 
uh, undertaking. They have 900,000 square feet. If they decide to reduce that by 15%, um, you know, it's a pretty significant uh, uptick in available space. I mean, that's real savings. $10 million since the beginning of the pandemic saved based on reducing your real estate footprint. They'll probably be in the majority of companies that have to look at this uh, from that perspective going forward. If you don't have people come into the office and you can generate, you know, million dollar plus savings, that has to become part of your overall strategy. All right, enough with that bad news. Let's, let's do some green shoots. Yeah, there was plenty of it. I'll, I'll run through these quickly, try to give credit where it's due. In Washington, D.C., two law firms have renewed at Nuveen's 1900 K Street. Together, they make up 220,000 square feet. Carly Tripp, a former guest of the podcast who runs Nuveen's real estate uh, division, will be very happy with this one. Uh, so two-thirds of the space at 1900 K Street will be renewed for the types of leases that, you know, you could have very easily seen reduced. Uh, that story comes from Keith Loria of the Commercial Observer. In San Jose, Logitech has leased almost 90,000 square feet in a North Jose office. This one is interesting because it's called the Assembly at North. It used to be Lamb Research's headquarters vacant since 2016. This is the first inkling of activity there in six years in a market that is generally considered pretty strong. So uh, a nice green shoot there. This is from The Real Deal's Matthew Niska um, in Chicago. Crane Chicago says that um, Google is looking for space in downtown for a thousand employees. One of the buildings they talked about was 135 LaSalle. But since we put out our research, it looks like they might be more interested in the Thompson Center, which is also downtown in Chicago. This is a tremendous one in San Francisco. Laura Waxman of the San Francisco Business Journal says that Google has taken over all of Stripe's former headquarters, Google Cloud's computing division, 300K at 510 Townsend, which is on sublet. and. Um, Lastly, Isabella Farr, who we mentioned earlier from The Real Deal, noted that Amazon signed the biggest lease of the year in Los Angeles, 200,000 square feet in Santa Monica. So lots of great things there. And that's just the leasing side of things. We could have also talked extensively about sales, of which there were many. I don't know that we all comprehend just how big the office market is in total. I mean, if you just listen to the green shoots here, couple hundred thousand square foot here, 250,000 square foot lease there. Um, the office market in the macro is just enormous. I mean, the amount of available space or occupied space, you know, is just really, really, it's just large, um, especially across the major, the major markets. I think Chicago, we've, we've had a lot of crabgrass stories in Chicago. I think, uh, was it Facebook that you said is looking at Chicago leasing? I'm a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's a narrative violation there if they're going to move on South LaSalle because I think every other company is on Wacker in Chicago. So if you've ever driven through there, um, you know, odds are you're stopping at a building located on Wacker. Then I think there's like three levels of it. So even the Uber drivers get confused there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if they actually move into a South LaSalle. Maybe that'll start a new trend in, the, uh, in that market in Chicago. Yeah, the point I try to make with all these green shoot stories is and kind of really what I started with the, with the open, which is, you know, the conveyor belt of economic activity just continues. And had we so uh, desired, we could have had, you know, we probably would have ran through six or seven green shoots very quickly. We probably could have done just as many property sales. And I'll throw through two very quickly. Just in Denver, uh, 1401 Lawrence, 233 million 750 bucks a square foot. That's a near an all-time record for that market in a market that is perceived to be softening, not Denver per se, but offices in general. You know, the seller of that getting a near record high price. That story was from The Real Deal, by the way. And in Scottsdale, uh, the combination Terra Verde 1 and Tower at Scottsdale Landing today sold for 85 million, 316 bucks a square foot. That comes from Connect CRE. So the the, the belt keeps moving. And as long as it keeps moving, this remains a healthy, healthy enough market, you know, and one that's not looking to be headed towards a 2008-like crisis. 
Let's wrap this up with a couple more green shoots, man, as we have one story from Commercial Observer, uh, Greg Cornfield. First Republic Bank signs a big expansion lease in LA's uh, Century City, signed one of the largest leases in LA so far this year in an expansion and renewal of their deal. San Francisco-based wealth management company signed on for about 156,000 square feet at 1888 Century Park East. That's according to Savile's second quarter office report. Uh, we have one other one here, Venture of MetLife Investment Management and PGGM has paid uh, $235 million or $518 a square foot for Intersect, a four-building office property, roughly about 500,000 square feet in Irvine, California. MetLife of Hanover, New Jersey and PGGM of the Netherlands Pension Fund Manager purchased the property from Heinz, which is based in Houston, uh, which had acquired the property in 2015. At that time, the building was only about 15% leased. Um, JLL brokered the latest deal, had 10-year uh, financing, $117 million loan to facilitate the purchase. So this is another great story uh, for what's going on. Uh, I was going to say, when you were talking about the sales prices per square foot, man, it's, you know how they say 50 is the new 40? I think $750 a square foot is the new you know, 500. Uh, or five, yeah, 750 is the new 500. It used to be 500 is kind of the watermark for office properties. And it seems like in these major markets now, it's 750 plus. And we got an alert just in from Natalie Satmichi from Cranes, a story that she broke regarding Revlon. Yeah, we talked about Revlon and Trepwire sometime in the last two weeks. They had filed for bankruptcy. We noted that in bankruptcy, you have the ability to reject leases or you know request a judge uh, allow a lease to be rejected. Firms do this all the time. And it is a concern uh, when you start having credit events among tenants. It's, it's one of those things that we are and were constantly on the lookout for during the five years when retailers were going bankrupt very frequently. Many of those retailers have big offices and and they had the ability to reject those leases. And it, it leads us to something we should probably get into a little bit more down the road, which is you have tons of unicorns out there like Peloton and Lyft and so forth, which are not cash flow positive, are burning cash. Now Peloton is subletting space. If they were to ever go into a restructuring situation, they would have the ability to potentially give back 300,000 square feet of space. So. Just like we talked about delinquencies, you know, blip or sort of a trend, who knows, but uh, good on Natalie for finding this story and, and tracking it down and pointing it out to the rest of us. Moving on to retail. You know, I think in retail, there was more green than crab, to be sure. I think in office, it was kind of a 50-50 mix, but in retail, there was, there was more good than bad. Run through those uh, pretty quickly in Los Angeles, the Sterling organization paid $164.6 million for a grocery anchored property uh, known as Plaza Mexico. The property backed a $106 million CMBS loan that backs CMBX 10. The loan was slated to mature in July 2021. The borrower filed for bankruptcy that year. A judgment a couple of months later allowed the collateral to be marketed for sale, and uh, the property was sold, as I said, for almost $165 million. Why do I like this particular story? Well, the collateral was valued at $184 million in 2016. So in a tough market for retail, you know, this saw only about, you know, less than a 10% reduction over the last five years in value. And somebody's willing to pay a, a decent nine figure amount for that property. Other sales that took place, although we don't have their, their acquisition prices uh, from Steve Brown of the da Dallas Morning News, Glades Park Town Center, uh, which Lonnie may know is in Colleyville near Dallas, uh, was sold. That has almost 560,000 square feet. Top tenants there include Belk, Dick's Sporting Goods, Michael's Home Goods, Boot Barn. Old Navy, JLL handled that sale. And also in Dallas, Cedar Hill Crossing, that's a nearly 200,000 square foot property sold that comes from Connect CRE. And then I'll throw in uh, two more, but I'll let you comment first on what you're seeing in Dallas, Lonnie. 
Yeah, I think the uh, the Dallas market is uh, is doing really well. I mean, Texas generally has been the benefactor of a lot of uh, migration here since the pandemic. So uh, if you look across Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, all of those markets have been doing very well uh, in the retail space. I did have a couple of other anecdotal notes here about New York City's retail. Uh, it looks like the retail asking rents have drawn closer to pre-pandemic levels. Marcus and Millichap put out uh, some numbers this week. Average retail asking rent climbed 2.9% in New York uh, year over year, um, March to March, reaching $57.95 per square foot. And the rate could recover to its full pre-pandemic level of uh, 58.45 per square foot by the end of the year. So I think, you know, Texas, it even looks like New York and the city has recovered on the retail side. So a lot of good news there. Two mall stories that broke uh, in the last 24 hours that we'll, we'll touch upon. Uh, one of which we'll be writing about, I think, on Monday morning, and the other doesn't touch CMBS, so we won't. Out in California, in Westminster, California, there's a West Westminster Mall, which backs a big CMBS loan. That loan, while it's been current, has posted DSCR numbers well below 1.0x, about 2.8x, I think, was the most recent for uh, 2021. So this is a mall that has been struggling, yet. Uh, earlier today, Shop Off Realty Investments acquired 14 acres uh, around that wall, including the Sears parcel, uh, buying all of it from Seritage, which is uh, the owning entity of Sears assets or Sears real estate. But they paid $46.3 million for this, right? This is a really hefty price for land around a mall that's not really performing. So I, I would call that a nice green shoot. Um, for mall demand. This one might be even bigger. This one is in Durham, North Carolina, Heritage Square uh, at the corner of Fayetteville Street and East Lakewood, which I would call land at this point. It's a, it's a defunct mall. There may be still stores open in it, but, it, but it's a barely functioning mall that sold recently for $62 million. Um, why did that catch my attention? Well, in 2019, that same piece of property sold for only $19.5 million. The new buyers are coming in. I think they have eyes on turning this into kind of a life science center. That Durham-Raleigh area has been a real magnet for that type of thing. But it just goes to show that not all malls will see their value, you know, reduced to that of a stocking stuff, right? Some of these things do have value left and and the worst case scenario may not play out. So we do have a hotel story that is a mixed grain. Yeah, thanks for the lead in on that, Martha. This was a part of the trading alert, a defaulted CMBX7 hotel was sold. Um, so according to the real deal, the Holiday Inn 6th Avenue in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood has been sold for 80.3 million. The story gave the impression that the loan has been assumed by the new buyers be consistent with recent special servicer commentary, which noted the special servicer was reviewing a loan assumption request and that the owner had agreed to sell the property. The loan was 30 days delinquent for the first time in November of 2020 and had not made a payment since September of 2020. Uh, however, sale and assumption would not bring the loan current. Um, the collateral is 226 Key Hotel in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood, so not far from Madison Square Garden and Penn Station was built in 2008, renovated in 2013, uh, had an original collateral value of about 114 million in 2013. The value was subsequently lowered to about 78.4 million in early 22, and had started to see a decline in the financial performance back in 2019 uh, with debt service coverage dropping to 1.01 .01 in 2019, uh, which was down from the 2018 number of 1.33. Uh, so this was, you know, a mixed green because it actually did transact. There was somebody willing to take on the note. Hopefully they have a revitalization plan in place for the property. However, the sale and assumption would bring the loan current. Yeah. And the one thing about this that really caught my attention was the assumption values this thing at about 350,000 per room. And we've seen a lot of this distress stuff go between about 185 per key and 215 per key. So this, you know, I don't think this is 
you know, a particularly fancy hotel. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's kind of like a, a you know, an everyman type of hotel. Um, the fact that they're willing, you know, to pony up that much money, uh, not as a special servicer for 10 or $15 million price reduction or something like that is a, is a positive sign in a market that is, has lacked too many green shoots in, in the last two years. So let's move on to shout outs. John B, I really enjoy the podcast and your insights. He had a thought about a comment made regarding office leasing, which we've talked about, and the market being 20 to 25% into the role post March 2020. And we haven't seen a market decrease in space utilization. Anecdotally, he thinks that many office tenants decided to do short term lease extensions to give them time to try to figure out their space needs. I think that's a great observation. You know, I was working under the thesis that, you know, all of the leases were evenly distributed over 10 years. And that if we're two and a half years into the pandemic, then one fourth of all leases would have rolled. Um, but his point is spot on that you probably had a lot of those leases um, in those first 27, 28 months that were extended, not another 10 years, but somewhere between two and five years. And so they kind of still fit into that category of uh, coming due in the next seven years. So uh, excellent point. And, and thanks for that alternative observation. And BB Dogged, recession and rising costs because of inflation are good excuses to embrace hybrid remote work to cut expenses and shed office space. And he gave that shout out on Twitter to our Tripwire uh, and Lonnie team. Stimpy Z1 on Twitter said Manus was growing horns again, and he actually pointed to the time segment, Manus, where you were bullish for the market, your case for the market, and why uh, why you think things uh, still could be, could be good. Well, I, I have to stick with my prediction from a couple of weeks ago, which is, you know, I think we will see a slowdown. We will see a reduction in value. I don't think it's going to be an epic collapse uh, like we saw in 2008. And I do think that the valuations, whether it's the stock market, uh, the U.S. economy, fundamentals, um, or commercial real estate, you know, rebound in 2023. I, I just think that the risky, this, you know, if, if 2008 was the 70s in terms of personal behavior, liberation, freedom, people going crazy in terms of lending, Right. It was, you know, the last five years, other than people paying a lot for properties, has been more of prohibition. Right. People have been keeping the bottle in the cork, paying a lot for properties, but not lending at a level which was reckless. Right. So somehow we'll come up with some kind of new moniker for that, that we could add to crabgrass and green shoots and bamboo. Right. This is not the, uh, the you know, the 70s all over again. This is a full garden here. We've got that's right. Growing. There we go. And our buddy Joe sent us a snippet from the Sheets Sheets. That's uh, just to give proper credit. Donald Sheets from Broadshore Capital Partners, whom we've had on the pod, and he gave us a little snippet talking about the recent volatility in debt capital markets and uh, increase in interest rates is creating headwinds for loan originations, and as a result, gives us the full explanation value for value add opportunistic assets will have uh, some downward pressure as financing costs uh, climb. So we probably don't have enough time to really dive into that, but we'll, we'll give that a little bit more due, I think, in an upcoming segment. We need to bring Professor Sheets back on to, yeah. uh, to give us the full view. We had him on, I think we've had him on twice, no? Is that I right believe, in the past? Yeah. And, uh, and, and excellent and always extremely well-prepared guest always comes loaded with facts and graphs and numbers and, and one of my favorite guests we should have him back yes and alex n looking to uh actually subscribe to trep after listening to the pod steven you appreciated the bed bath and beyond discussion jody y yanni m who actually uh said he thought he saw my doppelganger but it actually was me so uh it was not my double and Jason D. sent us a story of office buildings in Denver converting to residential apartments, a topic we've covered 
a couple of times um, on the podcast. And a couple of programming notes. TREP will be at the SF Vegas July 17th. If you're attending and you want to meet up, send us an email and we'll be happy to uh, set up a time to talk with you. And the TREP team will be hosting an affordable housing community call on July 27th on, at two o'clock. If you're interested in that, also send us an email and uh, we'll give you all the details so you can join us for that. Jody did text me separately, noting that uh, I am early on my prediction that industrial could be at a point where it's ready to level off in terms of valuations, demand, and uh, surging price per square foot. I, I was somebody who said, you know, at some point soon, uh, you know, we're about ready to see that market cool off. And, and, and she said we're a little bit early. So we'll have to watch that very carefully. And maybe she and I can bet a beer on, on where we'll be a year from now. In that vein, I did see a story this week that talked about uh, manufacturing coming back on shore here in the U.S. So a lot of manufacturing activity in the industrial sector. So maybe it's a little more diversified than what, uh, what we had anticipated it being. We'll have to see. So with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keene. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or comment, send an email to podcast at trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>